Our first speaker will be talking about Christmas in the prisoner of war camp after being shot down in the North Sea and surviving. The only survivor out of a crew of five. So I'm going to say, what? 1062112, and we're going to have Brian Wally come up to tell us what it was like in prisoner of war camp at Christmas. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Your German is not as good as mine. It should be Achtung. <laughs> I was asked to give you this talk, Christmas in, <coughs> pardon, in the POW camps. And for the, I'm going to read it because it'll come out gobbledygook if I try and do it off the cuff. It goes like this. For the record, I spent Christmas 41, 2, 3, and 4 in Germany all very different, and however bad they were, I must say, nothing like the hell endured by the Jap prisoners of war. Thank God I didn't get in that lot. Having been fished out of the North Sea more dead than alive on November 9, 1941, I spent the next five weeks recuperating in hospital before being sent on a three-day train journey from Frankfurt to Moosburg in Bavaria that being the closest station to Stalag 7A, where I spent my first Christmas in captivity. We lived in a barrack of 400 men, sleeping in three tier bunks, 12 bunks down each side of the uh, building, leaving the center to house a huge flat top stove, table and forms, never enough for all to sit down together. I was one of a party of 50 Air Force prisoners dumped into one of these barracks, already occupied by a conglomerate of army POWs, Anzacs captured in Greece and Crete, as well as Brits left behind after the fall of France. And another 50 Air Force personnel arrived in January 1942. And those hundred we stuck together for the rest of the war. So we got to know each other pretty well. The war wasn't going our way. Our guards were cock -a hoop masters of all Europe. Even so, we were treated reasonably well, quite unlike the poor bloody Russians in their own compound, wired off from the rest of the camp, who were classed as Untermenschen and treated like dogs. This then set the picture for my first Christmas in, as a POW. We had a distri distribution of Red Cross parcels each containing about 15 pounds of good, wholesome food. We still talked in pounds in those days. Designed to augment the basic German rations we were getting. I have to be honest, still recovering from my ordeal, I don't remember much about it. However, I do remember one of our RAF men, Winfield by name, with whom I had gone through training, telling his mates that he would cook, knock up something for tea he put a tin of meat onto the hot plate without puncturing it. <laughs> the devastation, of course, had exploded. So it's back to basic German rations for he and his mates until breakfast next morning. At breakfast time, to try and make amends, he offered to cook up some porridge. Took a tin of dry oats out of the Red Cross parcel, craftily punctured it, after the fiasco of the meat in the day before, put it on the stove as was. And of course the, uh, uh, the resultant uh, charred remnants couldn't be eaten. Made, uh, as, what, could, as was, yes. Another wasted effort, as the charred remnants couldn't be eaten. Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. Maybe not so wasted after all, as he was never allowed to cook again. <laughs> the only thing I do remember about that Christmas, it was white and bitterly cold. In September 1942, our host decided that all British NCOs, not out on working parties, would be moved to Stalag 383 at Hohenfels near Regensburg. Then followed a three-day train journey 
this time in cattle wagons, terminating in a 20 mile walk from station to the camp. Stalag 383 was different as chalk to cheese in comparison to 7A. Here we were housed in neat rows of comfortable chalet type huts, 16 men per hut. My home was hut 106, in which we had a mixture of RAF and ANZACs. By this time we had formed small syndicates for communal eating. Three of us had been together from our hospital days, myself, Bill Heyman, and Scotty both RNZAFM and we mucked in together. The camp was well organized. Food, both German and Red Cross, though never enough, was in reasonable supply. So much so that it was possible to save up for a good bash of Christmas. <coughs> <coughs> Meanwhile, Scotty, my New Zealand mate, decided that we ought to have a Christmas cake. Over time, we've been saving bits and pieces from our Red Cross parcels, such as butter, powdered milk, raisins, sugar, and packets of waste water biscuits, I should say, to be ground down into flour. We couldn't get flour anywhere. Just before Christmas, all these ingredients were lovingly mixed together. We all had a stir just for luck. And then put into a tin, up, into a tin and into our Heath Robinson oven to cook. After an hour or so, Scotty was in a quandary. How to test to see if it was cooked. He remembered how his mother used, had used a steel knitting needle. We didn't have one, so a somewhat rusty old nail had to do. With the test completed satisfactorily, the cake was taken out to cool down. Come Christmas Day, the cake, now resplendent with a sugar icing, was paraded around the hut. Being Scotty's brainchild, he had the honor of making the first cut, which he did in valiant fashion, rather like a pencil thrusting forward to jab the knife into the cake, followed by a gasp of disbelief. Good God, it's a pudding. <laughs> <laughs> he said, cake or not, we ate it anyway. Walter, our host, head of the cookhouse, had been saving up hams from the pigs issued, cured them to put into brine until we had enough to give each inmate, $5,000 incidentally, a couple of slices each for Christmas lunch. That night we went to bed happy with a full stomach, pleasant thoughts of being home for the next festive season. We relied on the Red Cross for the necessary instruments needed to form a band. The Germans had allocated a huge building for use as a theatre in which plays, musicals, sing-alongs were performed and very popular too. Of course, Christmas shows and carols took pride of place at that time of year. It being Christmas, nativity plays as well as other biblical shows were staged and well received by all, including the camp commandant and some of his officers who came to watch the first show However, our artistic director did blot his copybook in that at the end of the first show, the band struck up with God Save the King, which we gave a right royal rendition. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair to our host, they too stood up, obviously more than a little bit upset, but managed to stick it out without losing face. Next morning, our camp leader was well and truly on the mat. It was all right to have the national anthem after the show, but it must not be aired until the Germans had departed. We won that one. Some of our inmates were quite good looking for blokes. Many taken the roles of females in these plays. Tailors in the camps used whatever materials were available to knock out some very smashing outfits. Uh, if you want to see sort of sort of outfit that we did knock up, go and have a look in the uh, POW stand in the museum. And the photograph I brought back of one of the fellows dressed as a female, you wouldn't know it wasn't a girl. The cat calls and whistles from the audience being a strong reminder of the female company we were all missing out on. I never forget the night when two strapping guardsmen had a fight 
on who was to take the lady home, <laughs> both ending up in hospital. <laughs> it, it, it was that realistic. We didn't get home for Christmas 1943, by which time there was still no second front, things didn't look all that good. But we didn't have any option to make the best of it and try to enjoy the moment, perhaps without the zest of 1942. Up to now, we, the 100 Air Force prisoners, out of the camp strength of 5,000, and just in passing, out of the 5,000, we had a whip round to see who was the youngest in the camp. I was. <laughs> I was. I was only 19 when I went into that camp. Uh, we, were, we were having it easy in comparison to those in Luftwaffe camps. One has to bear in mind that the devastation being wrought on the fatherland by our bombers who were hammering their railways and by so doing making it very difficult to get our regular supply of Red Cross parcels, without which we are beginning to feel the pangs of hunger. This well-organized and reasonable existence in Stalag 383 came to a sudden halt when we, the 100th Air Force prisoner of war, were moved to Stalag Lufthorn in Poland, again by a cattle truck over a three-day period. Incidentally, I spent nearly two weeks in cattle trucks there been paraded around Germany. And it's not the form of transport I would advise anybody to uh, undertake. Here our troubles really started. It being a new camp far to the east of Switzerland, the source of all Red Cross parcels meant that from receiving one parcel per man most weeks up to then, we were reduced to one per ten, that is, if any at all. German rations wouldn't keep body and soul together. If you want to see what we could have looked like without these parcels, take a look at the photo of a Russian prisoner of war taken in Stalag 7A that I brought home with me, and now on the wall of the POW stand in the museum in Cold Creek. That's another one we've had a look at. Although writing was on the wall, and we would win the war, it was nevertheless taking too long. Christmas 1944 was a truly dismal affair. Short of food, and absolutely no festive spirit at all. Not much jubilation, no carols, and it has been said often, prison of war only had two topics of conversation, food and sex, and when food was scarce, only one, and it wasn't sex. <laughs> In January 1945, the camp was evacuated on foot. We walked almost back to Berlin, no doubt the worst three weeks of our lives. But I was back home in, for Christmas in 1945 to make up for the four I'd missed out on. Thank you for listening. I, I must tell you a little story. When I saw that, it reminded me of it. The Air Force personnel in Stalag 383 were living in huts like that. Uh, some of them started to carve little wooden aeroplanes with wooden propellers, stuck them up on the corner at the apex of the hut, propellers turning merrily in, in the wind, and they were a great sight. But there came a directive out from the German High Command. They had to be taken down. We were signaling to the enemy. <laughs> now, that wasn't quite the end of it because uh, one of our cartoonists in the camp came out next day with a beautiful cartoon. One of these huts with a little uh, airplane on each end taking off over the wire. And the German guard down below stamping his feet, that is for Borden! <laughs> Thank you.